we will have a live roundtable discussion about operational sustainability. How do we make perfect flights the norm? Dr. Susan Kearns from the Waterloo Institute of Sustainability Aeronautics will moderate the session together with our three experts from NAFBLUE, Logan Jones, Frolong, Luca, Martin Riot. Please welcome them on stage. Thank you. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here today. And to kick things off, I'd really like to open it with a question to all of you. When you think about the word sustainability, what do you think of? For many, I think we consider the environmental impacts of aviation. And we look to the future and think, well, this is a problem that will be solved in the years or decades ahead with the development of sustainable aviation fuels or hydrogen propulsion. But what we're really excited to talk to you about today is operational sustainability and the perspective that we can take the aircraft and the operations of today and make direct actions to fly them and operate them more sustainably. So our discussion today will focus on the three pillars of sustainability. So sustainability is about reducing negative environmental impacts while optimizing social and economic good. Mm -hmm. So you'll hear us refer to environmental, social, and economic sustainability as the three pillars that will structure our discussion. So I'm an academic a researcher and professor, and I'm joined on stage uh, with some of my colleagues. Martin, who, who will be talking to us Hi. from the perspective of airlines. Hi. Uh, Florent, who's an aerospace Hello. expert. And Logan, who will be sharing with us from the perspective of sort of a research and innovation. Yes, hello. So, Martin, I'd love to kick things off with a question to you. So lately, sometimes in the media, we're seeing reports of these green perfect flights, that just by changing the way we fly the aircraft of today, we can achieve up to 10% reductions in CO2. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, this um, green or perfect flight, as you said, is uh, really the demonstration of the potential, uh, what we can achieve. Yet generally, that's done amongst a group of airlines, for instance, in quite of a competitive way. Uh, and what it shows us is the necessity uh, of all the actors being really interconnected, coordinated. Usually you, you lift some constraints to allow some uh, these, uh, these green flights. But yeah, the, 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 this interconnection of all the actors, um, ANSPs, so air, uh, air navigation service providers, airlines, authorities, aircraft manufacturers. So it seems like it takes the entire aviation ecosystem to achieve some of these benefits? Yeah, exactly. So we cannot focus on one topic in an isolated way. So on an, on an airline level, it, it means putting together uh, flight operations, maintenance, training, uh, risk management. Um, and, and at NavBlue, we are really here to, uh, as Fabrice said, to, to cover the entire ecosystem. Uh, to reach this operational sustainability between the Airbus, the OEM, and the airlines. Yeah, it seems like with so many cooperative entities, it can be really challenging to get that whole ecosystem to work together. So at NavBlue, in some of the work you've done, do you have a concrete example of what's possible? Yeah, to, to, to give you an example, I've, I have in mind a co consulting mission uh, for which we, we, br we brought to the airline 1% incremental savings, so from ranging from from zero, from nothing, up to a full fuel program of 5%. So we, we, we bring this, uh, this 1%. Uh, we cover the usual suspects of fuel efficiency, but also organizational ways of working, uh, decision making, communication, which is critical, obviously, um, to, to really boost the fuel program. We also cover the use of airspace. How can we use uh, uh, better the airspace? And I think Florent will, uh, will expand on this. Well, I think that's such a good transition. And Florent, from the airspace perspective, of course we all can sort of intuitively understand the, the best way to fly from point A to point B would be a straight line, but we know that that's not always possible. Can you tell us a little bit more about why? Sure. So these uh, perfect flights are, are great initiative, as uh, Martin mentioned, uh, in a competitive, positive competitive uh, manner. Um, but they are usually um, one flight, and they're usually... Um, uh, lifting constraints. Uh, people, everybody's working so it works. Um, but there are a lot of ATM constraints um, to, to prevent that to happen every day all the time. And one thing for sure is that optimizing the, uh, the airspace 
um, structure, infrastructure, will uh, unlock significant benefits, and we should not forget about it. So there are several stakeholders to work on this. We should have them all uh, around the table. And we want at NavBlue to associate uh, ourselves with this effort, linking the different expertise, and embarking also the airlines who have a, a significant um, leverage on that or influence. Absolutely. And so I think many of us have heard the term performance-based navigation, sort of one of the key enablers of these perfect flights. But I understand that there are some distinct strengths and limitations of performance-based navigation, or PBN. Could you speak to that? Yeah, sure. So uh, PBN, or performance-based navigation, is, is great, a uh, great tool. Uh, it allows more direct routes, but it's been implemented in an uneven uh, manner, with an uneven level of uh, implementation. So it's not just about drawing lines. And um, many times it's been done as an overlay of um, conventional procedures uh, or not really thinking about uh, renewing the concept of operation, the CONOPS. Uh, and in this case, you will not have the, the whole potential. Um, so when defined properly, however, um, all stakeholders being ar around the table and uh, willing to challenge the status quo, uh, make some changes in the, in the way of doing, then uh, new designs will allow big results the continuous descent, the continuous climb, track my savings, ATC workload reduction, um, and also noise impact reduction. It's outstanding. And when this can be achieved, what sort of benefits are possible? Well, um, to take an example of what we did in, uh, in Shanghai, so we worked with uh, the ATC, the regulator, some airlines over there, some data as well, it's uh, necessary. And our simulation showed that uh, redesigning the, uh, the airspace uh, around Shanghai area, two, two big airports over there, uh, we could uh, reduce the fuel consumption by around 300,000 tons per year. So that's at simulation stage. Um, but that, that's great. Um, another uh, example on the other uh, side of the spectrum is uh, something I, I like is RNPR. It's a bit specific, but uh, at Ajaccio recently uh, in Corsica, they implemented a new procedure, and that is preventing 20 diversions uh, a year, saving track miles, uh, and allowing continuous descent. So two sides. You need data to prove that, but that's uh, examples. It's, it's a brilliant example, and I think so important for our audience to hear is that these improvements, when you are saving and reducing emissions, you're also saving fuel burn. So it's improving both environmental and economic sustainability of operations. So Logan, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your perspective, and specifically when we're talking about these green flight initiatives, that certainly there are elements of those flights that are unpredictable, like the weather or, or delays and, and other, other aspects that could pop up. Can you speak to how those can be managed? Yeah, so you know, even if we have the, you know, the airspace has been designed perfectly, we know that there's always going to be congestion, there's always going to be delays. So to give you some examples, you know, pre-COVID in 2019 when aviation was really booming, what we saw was about one in four, uh, or sorry, one in five, 20% of flights were being delayed with an average delay of 60 minutes in the US and up to 30 minutes in Europe. So obviously during COVID, that, you know, those delays have gone down, but now as we're coming back out of this, the delays are coming right back with it. So you know, just last month in uh, the US in April, you know, we were back up even higher than before. So we actually had 25%, one in four flights was being delayed. So as the traffic comes back, so has the delays and the congestion. Yeah, and, and coming back to the theme of these three pillars of sustainability, so environmental, economic, and social, can you speak to how those delays impact the different aspects of sustainability? Yeah, so definitely delays, cancellations have a significant economic impact on the airlines. And we have to remember at the root of this, you know, what we want is for our airlines to be economically sustainable. Uh, if we want the airlines to invest in sustainability, to be able to purchase save sustainable aviation fuel, to renew their fleet with new, more efficient aircraft, at the very basic, they have to be economically sustainable. So if we can reduce delays and cancellations, we can increase you know, the economic sustainability of the airline. And of course, there's also an environmental impact. So you know, what happens at an airline, as soon as you start to get behind schedule, the focus of the airline is now to get back on schedule. So that may mean doing things like speeding up the aircraft in order to kind of recover some of that time. And so now you're no longer flying at the most cost and fuel efficient speed. Same thing with anything around uh, the airports. You know, once congestion starts to happen, 
uh, ATC has to manage that congestion. So they might put you into holding patterns, they might have you do vectoring, uh, you might not be able to do that continuous descent approach that you had planned uh, as part of your perfect flight. Those don't become possible when we have this delays and congestion in the airspace. Absolutely, and I think as well about social sustainability, about making sure our passengers are happy, but as well as our crew and, and the impact of delays uh, on, on them certainly would have a negative impact as well. So how can this be mitigated? So how can we improve our ability to predict these kinds of situations and add a level of robustness to the system? Yeah, so the, the approach we're taking at NavBlue is, you know, obviously we want to work on, on designing a better airspace, on improving our operational uh, sustainability, but we also have taken the approach that delays, uh, congestion, it's always going to happen. But in, you know, in the era of, of big data, uh, aviation is a complex ecosystem, but you know, we're working a lot with academia to try to increase the predictability of operations. So if we know that these delays uh, and congestion are going to happen, but we can start to kind of pull out you know, the characteristics, the what, what's going to lead to these congestions and delays, we can help airlines be a bit more proactive in that process. Uh, so the, the more you know ahead of time uh, where these things are going to happen, you can make decisions to try to mitigate the impact. So we have the predictability side, and then we can use that predictability to add robustness. So robustness is really about having a, a schedule of operations, whether it be your crew planning, your, your network planning, or even your flight plan, that is more robust to change, uh, that, that takes into account that unpredictability we know that's going to be there, but tries to optimize your operations for that unpredictability. Absolutely. So I'd love to shift gears a little bit and touch on an issue that I think uh, taps into all of your areas of expertise, and that's really around fuel efficiency. Because I think this is such a, a winning solution for everybody in our ecosystem, because if we're flying more efficiently, we're burning less fuel, of course that's reducing costs, uh, but it's also reducing emissions. So can we speak maybe from your perspective about uh, how we can optimize fuel efficiency? Marta, maybe you could kick us yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, so as, um, as you said, fuel efficiency program has, has been put in place in, uh, within airlines. Um, fuel efficiency program are 15 years old or ish and have been triggered, have been put in place in, 20, in 2008 uh, due to a, a dramatic fuel increase. Um, so we know that savings are up to 5% of an annual fuel slip, but even today in 2022, we, uh, many initiatives are not, not applied at full potential. And can you speak to why that is? I think that may be surprising to a lot of people. Yeah, so the full potential is not reached because uh, somehow each initiative are, are quite hard to isolate, to measure with, uh, with a good level of certainty, and uh, uh, somehow brings uh, uh, an marginal, uh, in, in, incremental value. So that's really a, a fuel program all in all. So a, country, a combination of a good number of, of fuel initiatives that start to make things uh, uh, noticeable and impactful. And uh, um, uh, Airbus is doing its part of the job by um, investigating how we can uh, go further, support further uh, with the green operating procedures, uh, so, such as the single engine taxi out, for instance. Yeah, I, here, if I can jump in, I think the, those initiatives are, are really important. Um, they step by step, as Marta mentioned, they, they are building the, the overall results. However, it uh, could be a bit frustrating, right, if you, you make all of that as, a, as an airline, uh, you make all these efforts, and then you end up uh, wasting uh, at least the equivalent or much more uh, at your destination airport because of holding level of that, et cetera. So um, it can only be fully realized uh, if they are done in coordination with ATC or AT. Um, and optimize use of, uh, of airspace. So an example on, on Bogota, for example, we did some work a few years ago and we uh, could, with the redesign, save about 60% of the communication of ATC. So that seems a bit strange as a KPI, but that allows ATC to focus on the important stuff mm -hmm. and let uh, the other uh, aircraft working well then optimizing their, their own flight. And that saved about 23% uh, of the uh, track miles uh, distance in the terminal area. Tremendous. You can imagine how those benefits would accumulate over time. So uh, a final question I'd really like to ask all of you is, is really around the theme of data analytics. And I think NABLU has tremendous strength in this area. But for many in traditional aviation, it may seem like a, a newer concept. Can you speak to maybe the 
uh, benefits that can be unlocked through data analytics. Yeah, so the, the, the place given to da data analytics, so Logan mentioned uh, machine learning and, uh, and big data. Fabrice, a few minutes ago, mentioned data, data analytics. So that's the, the place given to this area. Uh, uh, today, with the uh, aircraft recorder, uh, recording data, so QAR, quick access recorder, we can continuously monitor the performance of a given tail, a given aircraft, and consequently, better plan the, 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 the future flights and better execute with the FMS. Uh, uh, and the, 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 the consequence of this, again, is, uh, is reduce margins, reduce reserves, contingency fuels, etc. Better use, better knowledge of the aircraft means better use of the asset, uh, so assigning the best performing aircraft on the more demanding route, for instance. Um, yeah, some, some examples of savings, for instance, up to 45 kilograms in climb, 90, up to 90 kilograms in descent. Yeah, and I think it's the same thing on the predictability side. You know, people ask, why are we suddenly doing predictability and robustness now? Uh, and it is the availability of data. So, you know, from the ANSPs who are now being able to provide what we call swim data about where are the delays and the congestions, uh, we can archive that. We have you know, much more weather provided. So we, we're starting to put together all the pieces that are really you know, unlocking that potential to build the predictability. We also see airlines being much more willing to share their data because we can now start to really prove the benefits that sharing the data can bring to the operators. And so th this is important to have uh, this data, as you mentioned, from the airline, from the NSPs. Um, but we also work um, at early stage sometimes of projects uh, with uh, ADSB data. Um, that prevents us from, uh, or that allows us to, to uh, not use uh, the customer data directly and with uh, what's available uh, from uh, ADSB data lakes, we can already do a lot of um, pre-analysis to understand where there are uh, benefits that needs to be unlocked and where uh, air airlines compare to, to each other. So it's really uh, useful and it's agnostic. Wonderful. And I think it's truly inspiring to realize the benefits that are possible today. Um, so to wrap up, I'd really ask uh, each of you to share maybe a final word for the audience. We could start with Florent and Logan and, and Martin. Sure. So um, for all of you here, uh, we know that traffic is not yet back to 2019 levels. However, the peaks, uh, the, the tension uh, moments uh, are back there. So actions can be taken now and should be done now. Yeah. And, and along those same lines, you know, with that, those peak uh, travel is going to come the congestion and the delays. So if we can get a higher level of predictability into your operation, we can allow the airlines to be much more proactive in their decision making. Yeah, not willing to reiterate too much with uh, uh, what my two colleagues said, the importance of operational data. And uh, basically, we can't improve what we can't measure. Absolutely. Thank you so much to all of you. I truly enjoyed leading this discussion on how we can promote operational sustainability today. So I hope all of our airline partners have taken some nuggets of information that they can apply to their own operations. And I'd just like to close with a challenge to all of you to think about what you can do today to optimize your operational sustainability so that collectively as an industry, we can achieve a sustainable future together. Thank you.